been one of the very few apologists. Is that what you call it? One of the very few apologists we have in this nation. Trained in Oxford University. So when it comes to stating your case and taking your stand for the truth, especially in the postmodern era, that is a blessing to the body of Christ. So let's rise to our feet as we welcome Apostle Gideon Odoma. Hallelujah. Uh, it's such an honor, it's a privilege, uh, a huge one to be standing here uh, this evening. I want to appreciate God for uh, the opportunity and the honor to be here. And I want to thank our Father in the Lord and our mommy for uh, the privilege uh, to be here. It's, it's something that I don't take for granted at all. I want to appreciate God for all the fathers in the faith, elders in this gospel uh, that are here this evening. It is a huge, huge privilege for me to be standing here this evening to um, bring a few thoughts from God's word as we seek to confront the darkness in our own generation. Let us pray. Lord, we ask tonight that you will open our eyes to see, you will open our ears to hear, you will enlighten our hearts together, make us quick of understanding. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please, you may be seated in God's presence. In in every generation, in every civilization, there has always been the, the need to legitimize ideas, philosophies, belief system. Um, even the things that we call faith systems, uh, like Christianity is a faith system. So when we talk about the Christian faith, uh, every faith in that sense has its reasons because faith has its reasons there's a reason why if you walked into this place and the chair they wanted to have you sit upon you realize that it has only three legs uh, you may not be very confident to go straight and sit on it because you don't have faith that it will carry your weight that means that in order for you to without hesitation to take the seat you were offered here, you believed that this seat is able to carry your weight. Now, that your belief is not misplaced, there's a reason why you believe so. Number one, you have found that, okay, this thing is made of iron, and then you know the, the reputation of metals, isn't it? What I'm simply saying is that faith has its reasons. Faith has its reasons. The reason why we express faith in God, faith in God is not baseless, is not unreasonable. Because if God created the world, if God is without beginning and without ending, then it is reasonable to trust such a personality. It will actually be unreasonable to not trust in God. It will not make sense that a thinking person will not repose his, tr his trust and confidence in God properly defined. So one of the things that you notice when you begin to engage people in a postmodern world is that the general notion of postmodernism is basically the death of both truth and the death of absolutes. The death of objective standards. Objective as opposed to subjective. That is to say, uh, if something is objective, for instance, 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. The answer of 2 plus 2 does not depend on how you see it. If you get my point. So there is an objective reality. Alright? In the sense of 2 plus 2 objectively is equal to 4. So if you if you had um if you had a millionaire in the bank and then you had withdrawn five hundred thousand naira at some point and then you go back to the bank again and you you write a check for them to give you a million naira 
and they say to you that what you have here is 500,000. You cannot say, well, it depends on how you see it. As far as me, I'm concerned. My money is one million naira. So you see, when people want to use this whole idea of, you know, it depends, it depends, it depends. It is, it is a sly way of smuggling corruption into the system of thought. And people only try to do that with the most important matters of life. Unfortunately, matters of life, the big issues of life. If, if you are going to board an aircraft and then the pilot say, you know, never say never. I'm just, I, I hope we get to where we are going. It's not as if anybody, you see? <laughs> So at certain levels, even in a postmodern world, people only are selective about the things that they subjectivize. All right? The things that really that they think really touch their life. Nobody wants to be relativistic about those matters. Everybody wants you want to be sure that the person who is going to move this aircraft has the requisite training and skill to get you there. Nobody says, maybe, maybe, well, it depends on how you see. If we arrive, it's fine. If we don't arrive, it's, you know, it really depends. It doesn't depend on how you see it when you get to that point. Or, you know, if, 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 if you wanted to, if you went to the pharmacy to buy a medication, all right, and then you bought the medication, and then on the bottle you see that uh, it, it kills some people, it heals some people. <laughs> it, it just depends on how you see it <laughs> right exactly when it comes to the medication you want to take you also want to be sure you don't want to be subjective about it you don't want a relative you know you don't want a subjective position about the medication that you want to take now if God exists and that's the first issue to deal with as Christians, the locus, the grounding of all reality is God. And we need to say, if God exists, if God exists, then truth is of utmost importance. If God exists. Of course, in the postmodern world, and because of the internet and uh, civilization that we are in now, everybody is basically everywhere. Uh, you know, back in the day, if you are from Africa and of African descent, the issue of God was taken for granted. Like, everybody believed in God. I remember um, um, I was dealing with somebody I'd, when I went to Oxford and I had to, I went to the bank to open an account. And in the course of talking with the teller that was attending to me, what are you doing here? I, because I was looking for an opportunity to preach the gospel. Uh, I said, um, it's apologetics. And she's like, what's that? So immediately, one of the things you observe is this. Every time that people ask you a question, they have given you the license to talk. All right? If somebody asks you a question, that person is giving you the license to talk to him. So when you engage, when you evangelize, one of the things you want to do is always try to put yourself in a place where people can ask you questions. Now, if somebody asks you a question and you are simply responding to it, the person can no longer accuse you of intruding into their personal space. Isn't it? Yes. So, when he, she said, what's that? That is a free ticket to talk to her about what apologetics is. And so, I went on and on. And one of the things I told her was that where I come from in Africa, we believe in God so much that the trouble is which one is the real one. And you guys in this place, you, you are supposed to be, from what I heard, you are supposed to be more advanced than us. And you people here are still debating whether God exists at all or not. We have passed that place. Our own is, we are saying, which of them is the real one? <laughs> you people are still trying to figure out if God exists or if God does not exist. And, that, and the second thing I told her was that a lot of people in the West have decided to not believe in a God that they have not investigated. And again, that I found that to be disappointing. Because many people here basically have disbelieved God on the basis of authority. 
So somebody that they, they respect, if a popular person, an influential person, had just said it's nonsense, there's nothing there, it's myth, it's legend, it's, it's not real. And that everybody just believes it because one person said it. And, like, and I said to her that I think it is intellectually dishonest to throw away a system, something that has such ramifications, like if there is life after death, that's not a matter you want to take simply on another person's authority without investigating it for yourself. And again, it, like if it's where I come from, I will even understand. But here, you all claim that everybody has a mind of their own. If you have a mind of your own, why have you rejected Christianity when you have not investigated it? And she said, well, it's true. You know, when I was 11, I went for one party. In fact, like the last time she was anywhere that anybody said a prayer was when she was 11 years old. She went to a party. And that uh, actually is true, what I said, that they've rejected Christianity without investigating it. That is there any way she could? Ah, why not? So she gave me her personal email so I could recommend books to her so that she could go on a personal investigative journey of the Christian faith. Because... Faith has its reasons. Faith has its reasons. That was why that day when Peter saw somebody walking on water and they were all scared. And Jesus said, be not afraid, it is I. Huh? Peter said, Lord, if it be thou. You see, that's a conditional statement. <laughs> to say the only grounds on which I will step out of this boat onto the water, it has to be because it is you. If it is not you, I'm not leaving this place. Faith has its reasons. It has its reasons. Say, if it is you, call me to come. The you that I know, if you tell me to walk on this water, I will walk on this water. If it is you. If it be thou, bid me to come. So, I will tidy this talk up by bringing that God equation back to the table. But for now, I want you to know that in a postmodern world, one of the things that modern, postmodern humanity is trying to do is to discountenance God completely. So even in our own society now, even here in Nigeria, you hear people every now and again say, you know, take Christianity out of it. Don't bring Christianity out into it. Don't bring Christianity into it. Now, if, if your religion, call it a religion, if your religion is not important enough to give me an idea of the kind of person you will be at work, of the kind of policies you will make if I make you a senator, if your religion is not important enough to give me an idea of the kind of policies and of the kind of ideas that you will stand behind, your religion is of no value. Are you with me? I mean, if, if so, sometimes when I hear people say things like, let's take religion out of it. Let's take, of what use is your religion if we should take it out of life? And the sad thing is that many Christians have bought into that lie. The fact that somebody claimed to be a Christian and then they got a position and they misuse it, does not do anything to the fact of the matter. And the fact of the matter is that your belief should inform life. Right believing is necessary for right living. Right believing is necessary for right living. So it's important that I know what you believe. If what you believe does not influence how you live, you don't believe it. So it's important that we do not buy into the postmodern lies that are smuggled upon us. You see, anybody can say, hey, in postmodern world, they say, you know, everybody is their own person. They can say whatever they want to say. They can do whatever they want to do. Then suddenly you realize that it's only a set of people that can say whatever they want to say and can do whatever they want to do. So you'll find out that those that say a man can be a woman, a woman can be a man. 
for them, they can say whatever they want to say. Isn't it? Then if another person comes and say, no, if you are not a man, you are not a man. Then they will now suddenly say, no, you can't say that. So on the one hand, they, they want to smuggle in this relativistic, subjective ideology, but they cannot be consistent with it. If everybody is okay, it depends on what you believe. Why can I not believe that a man is a man and can never become a woman? Why can I not believe that? So let us, let us, the, the, the next thing I want to say is, let us not believe because it's erroneous. Let us not believe that Christianity cannot stand its ground in the marketplace of ideas. You remember the school of Tyrannus? What Paul was doing at the school of Tyrannus, the school of Tyrannus was not, um, it, it wasn't a religious institution. In fact, in Acts chapter 17, when Paul was on Mass Hill, the people he was talking to, they were in very, to use a broad stroke, they were pagans. And when Paul spoke on Mass Hill, he spoke to them defending the credibility of the Christian faith. And he did that so beautifully that, in fact, at some point, he quoted one of their poets in order to make his own point. Because the belief has always been, this is a belief that the fathers have held through the ages, that all truth is God's truth. Anywhere you find truth, it belongs to God. Satan does not have truth. Anywhere you find truth, it belongs to God. So, and in, Acts, in, in, Hebrew, in Romans chapter 1, the Bible talks about those that hold the truth in unrighteousness. You remember? In, in, in Romans chapter 1, it talks about those that hold the truth in unrighteousness. So, there is an unrighteous system. As a system, it's unrighteous. But because every human being still bears the vestige of the image of God, there is something, there is that spark, the image of God, the vestige of it in every human being means that there will be somewhere a strand, a strand of truth. It will be modeled up in the corruption that we have entered into. But if you dig carefully, like Paul did on Mass Hill, you will find that even in the most absurd societies, there is always a witness. There is a witness that you came from God. So missionary talks, talk about redemptive analogies, right? They go, if you've done missions training, you go into a mission society and if you look right, you will see part of the indigenous practices of the people that you can actually use to help them to understand parts of the gospel because there are redemptive analogies in every culture. The reason is because all of us were made in the image of God. And even though we are fallen, there is something of the vestige of that image that remains in every one of us. It will be in a, lie, in, in a lying system. It will be in an altogether unrighteous system. But if you know how to sift the wheat from the chaff, you will find at least a grain. And Paul found one on Mass Hill. He said, even as one of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. He was quoting Aratos. Now, Aratos was one of them. A popular figure. If it's today, it will be like, you know, how do you call them? Is he an influencer or whatever? A, a celebrity, all right? But he was a literary figure. So everybody knows Aratos. It's like if I was preaching to a bunch of unbelievers today, and I said, and we don't know after talking, talking, I say, you remember that even we skid? Yeah? You say, you are a preacher. How do you know we the, the moment you mention even we skid, you know there are some people that that's the first time they'll pay attention to you. Like, what? That was what Paul did on Mass Hill. He said, as one of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. This will, would have made them so excited. Like, yeah, you know, he's quoting our man. They didn't realize that he was setting them up for the slaughter. As one of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Everybody is happy. Then he now said, if then we are his offspring. 
Ha! I said, this is not going to end well. He said, if then we are his offspring, then you should not think that the Godhead is like unto graven images, like silver, like gold, like stone. He, you, you, know, you know the double hammer that Paul is bringing down here. If your poet, you people say, we are the offspring of God. And Paul is saying, I agree. But he's saying that if you are right, then you are wrong. Because if we are his offspring, how then do you think that that God, whose offspring we are, is like this your gold, this silver image, this stone statue that you people are worshipping? And the sting in the tail is at least in two respects. Number one, like begets like. If we are his offspring, how can he be stone? And we are like this. Have you seen where stone gave birth to a human being before? Number two, if we are his offspring, why does he depend on us to exist? Because this thing is graven by the hand of man. It means you have to exist in order for this your God to exist. When did you hear of a child giving birth to its parent? Because this your God, you pre-exist, you, you existed before your God. And we agree that we are the offspring of God. So it means you got the wrong one. All of this, all of this to this point, Paul has not yet quoted one verse of the scripture. Because he was dealing with a people that did not have that common, com, that, that common agreement and commitment to the fidelity of scripture. So he, he met them on their ground. And then he began to move them away from there. Gradually, gradually, gradually. And then ended up with a historical fact that God is the one, I, the real one is the one I came to talk to you about. And that one has commanded all men to repent. And he has set a day that he will judge everybody by that one that he has ordained, even Christ Jesus. And he has given us proof that by Christ he will judge everybody by the resurrection from the dead. By raising Jesus from the dead, God has proven that it is he that will judge all of humanity. I want you to believe and to know that Christianity can stand its ground in the marketplace of ideas. It can. It can. It was Galileo that said that the God who gave us a mind did not intend that we should forego the use of it. If you are sitting here, say amen. amen. And then as... as an expression of God's commitment to the fidelity of his purposes. He gave us a book. We call that book the Bible. You, you, you would have realized that even though the Bible is the most read book in all of human history, the Bible is the most translated book in all of human history, the Bible is the most printed book in all of human history since, particularly since the Enlightenment. There has been incessant dogged attack to cancel the Bible. You know, we live in a cancel culture. You know what is cancel culture? That is, if, you, if, if we don't like you, we will cancel you. That canceling means that we will, we will buy you, we will make you a persona non grata in the public space. We will go out there on social media and then we will go and, you know, we we'll make statements. We say, this person must not be platformed. This person must not be platformed. So, then we protest. Say, ah, we saw this person coming to your university to come and give a talk. Therefore, we withdraw all our sponsorship to your university. That's how to cancel somebody. But they say, ah, call the name of the big company. You are see, this person is your brand ambassador and he said something we don't like until you remove him. We will no more buy your products anymore. It's a cancel culture. Human beings have been trying to cancel the Bible for hundreds of years. But as a wise man said, they've tried to bury it, but the Bible has always outlived its poor bearers. 
You see, those people that do pam 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 pam. When they say, now Bible, they go buried like this. Eh? It, it, by the time those people have been buried, the Bible will still be standing. That's what has happened generation after generation after generation. And in fact, you know, God has a sense of humor. Um, I've forgotten the country, somewhere in Europe. A very, very outspoken atheist, a professor, if I remember, had said that in the next 50 years, on account of their labors, all the things they were churning out and teaching, huh? that the Bible will be forgotten. The Bible will be forgotten. Its memory will be forgotten in 50 years. You know what happened? 50 years later, they were printing the Bible from his house. And it was not intentional. It wasn't intentional. 50 years later, the old man had died. Things, different things had happened. The house he used to live in, when he said all those things, had gone up for sale. The Bible Society of the country had bought it and established a press there before they even realized that, oh, this is the house of the man that said in 50 years, the Bible will be forgotten. 50 years later, his house is hosting the Bible. They are, they are churning Bible now out of his house. Out of his house. This Bible has changed lives across millennia. People have read it and light has dawned upon their souls. Every generation, there are different kinds of attacks that people try to marshal against the Bible. But as the testament that God is giving to us, in both the old and the new, it's important for us as believers to have confidence in the credibility and the reliability of the text of scripture that we have. One of the things you, you let me walk you through a few. One of the things you, you need to note is this. You see, the, the Bible as we have it today is a compendium of books. It's like a library of 66 books written across about 1,500 years by about 40 different writers, or you can call them authors. But in the strict sense of the word, the Bible has an author. His name is God. And then he had used about 40 writers. Uh, but in academic parlance, they use them interchangeably. So you can talk of authorship, uh, human authors, all right? And then there's a divine author. And despite the fact that you can imagine that a book was compiled by people that lived over 1,000 years. The first one that was written was about 1,500 years older than the last of the material that was written. Yet there is unbelievable symmetry, unbelievable agreement between all of them. Between all those books that were written by people, many of whom never met lived in different generations, in different millennia, in different centuries. So, when, when the skeptics, when they become very unsure of what to do with scriptures, they start to generate all kinds of, uh, all kinds of ideas. Now, the, the few things I want to say to us, uh, just to help us is this. I want to give you a little idea of the kind of resource that we have behind our Bible. The Bible that you read. All right? There is not just, it's not as if there is one parchment that contains all the books of the New Testament and that's where everybody is translating the Bible from. That's not how it worked. So the Bible began to be spread. The books of the New Testament particularly, they began to spread so fast in the early days of the apostles that a unification attempt was absolutely impossible. By that I mean to say, it was, no, it was not possible at a later time for anybody to say, let's gather all the copies so that we can unify them and make them say the thing we want them to say. All right? That is done elsewhere, but it couldn't have happened with the Bible. And why we know now is because of the sheer magnitude, the number of manuscripts that we have that come from different, different locations. Okay? Um, so, 
what this means is this. Okay, let me explain to you. If, if I write a book, and then the book is copied, is copied in, let's say, 15 places from the first one I wrote, then those 15 copies are sent to 15 states of Nigeria. Are you with me? Then when they get to those 15 states, they copy them again and spread them like that. They copy them in one other, in Ondo state and spread in that region. Somebody copied in Borno state and spread into their own region, into Niger. If you come back 100 years later and you say, we, we, need, to, we, not, we need to unify this book. We have an agenda that we want to smuggle into this book. Where will you start from? And the issue now is that, so let's say another 100 years later, archaeologists, all right, begin to find copies of the first copy. You remember I said you, you copied it into 15 places. So when you find a manuscript that went to Ondo, it has its own manuscript genealogy. So there are manuscripts that are in that region. There are manuscripts that went in this other direction. What we have found is that irrespective of where you find it, they all say the same things. So the idea that the church sat down in the 3rd century or 4th century in the council of Nicaea and then decided that let's streamline it like this. We now have manuscripts that are older than that council. And those manuscripts say exactly the same things that the manuscripts after the council say. Do you get the point now? If there was an attempt, so let's say a book was written in 1980. Then in, uh, in 2000, people now gathered and say, you know what? Let's put this book together. Let's, let's rewrite it. They revise it and then they change some things. Then in 2023, we now found the one that was written in 1980. We find copies of the ones from 1980. We find copies of the ones from 1990. And then the one that we have that was printed in 2000, we also have copies of it. If the, Bible was, if the book was revised in 2000, in the year 2000, you would expect, therefore, that the content would be different from the ones that existed before 2000. I'm saying that in the case of the Bible, when we have found, the more manuscripts we find, the more confident we are because the Bible agrees. The manuscripts, they do agree. Number two, let me give you manuscript evidence for ancient writings. What I mean by this is that we have books that come from antiquity. You must have heard of people like Plato, Aristotle, isn't it? All right. Caesar, Julius Caesar, or, okay? Those ancient personalities that we have heard of. Let me tell you a few things. What do we know about Caesar? How do we know what we know about Caesar about Caesar? So, the book, the auto, the bios of Caesar, was written about 100 to 44 BC, that, that the book was written before Christ, between 100 years to 44 years before Christ was born. That was when the book was written. The earliest copy of that book that we have, huh? the earliest copy, the earliest manuscript that we have comes to us from AD 900. That is to say the oldest copy of that book comes to us from 900 years after Jesus. The book was written about 100 years to 40 years before Jesus, which means between the writing of the book itself and the earliest copy that we now have, the earliest copy we have was written 1,000 years after the first one was written. Yet, nobody argues the content of the biography of Caesar. That's not all. Number three, how many extant manuscripts do we have? Like how many manuscripts of this book have we found? Do you know the number? Ten. 
We have 10 manuscripts of Caesar, his biography. Plato, Plato was 427 to 347 BC. The earliest copy we also have comes from 900 AD. The gap between, therefore, is 1,200 years, and we have only seven copies. Homer, the Iliad of Homer, I'm calling the ones that I think are more popular, was written 900 BC, 900 BC. The earliest copy we have is 400 BC. So it was written 900 years before Jesus was born, and the earliest copy that we have was written 400 years before Jesus was born. So the gap between the first man, the, the writing, the original writing, and the el earliest manuscript that we now have is 500 years. How many copies do we have? We have about 643 pieces, copies of the manuscript. So let's run to the New Testament, which is our focus. The New Testament was written between AD 440 and 100. That means it was written in the first, within the century that Jesus Christ was born. Are you there? So, in the lifetime, all the books of the Bible were written in the lifetime of the original eyewitnesses of the event. In fact, when Paul was making his point in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, talking about the gospel, which is the death of Jesus Christ died according, for our sins according to the scripture, and he was buried, and he was raised again according to the scripture. And then he now said he was seen of many. He said at one point he was even seen of, of up to about 500 people. He says some of them have fallen asleep, but some of them are still here. That is to say, if you doubt what I'm saying, you can go and ask questions. First Corinthians was written at about um, AD 51. We can tell that because he mentions, you know, we can tell his trip to Corinth from Acts of the Apostles. And mentioning the person that was like the mayor, if I may use that word, of the city. So archaeology has helped us to be able to, de to decipher the exact year that this person, uh, that would be in um, Acts of the Apostles, I think in chapter 19. All right? So we can now tell because in those days, like when people make coins in most of the monarchies, when you make coins, you don't just put the head of anybody that happened to be popular. It's a king. <laughs> it's his head that will be on the coin. And he ruled for one year. So when we found that coin and saw the year in which the coin was made, we can now tell with accuracy the dating of First Corinthians. So First Corinthians was written at about AD 51. Now, 51, therefore, is at the very most, is about 20 years after Jesus Christ went to heaven. Because if Jesus Christ lived for 33 years, all right, the dating because of the margin uh, is about three years thereabout. So, even if you say, okay, you know, the dating starts from three years afterwards or three years before, you are still within 20 years. That means that that epistle was written, the writing, within 20 years of the events that happened in the life of Jesus. But, some of the other books like Revelation, there's argument over whether it was written before AD 70 or not. Okay, because the mention of the temple, the temple in Jerusalem was not mentioned in the book of Revelation. So some people believe it was written after AD 70. There are a few scholars that make a case for the fact that it was written before. But the bottom line is, if you look at AD 100, AD 100 at the very most is about 70 years. Are you with me? After the ascension of Jesus. But the earliest copy that we have of the New Testament, the earliest parchment of any text of the New Testament, not complete. All the other ones I mentioned also is not complete. All right? But the earliest manuscript that we have for the New Testament, it comes to us from AD 125. AD 125. So what is the time span? So the time span between the writings of the New Testament and the earliest manuscript we have is between 25 years to 50 years. Are you with me? What I mean is this. The, the one that was written originally by the apostles, 
Huh? The gap between that original one and the copies that we have is not more than 50 years. The earliest copy that we have is just about 50 years away from the original one. You know the only one that comes close to the New Testament is Homer. And you know the, the difference? 500 years. Where the gospel is doing 50 years, Homer is doing 500 years. Caesar, 1,000 years. Plato, 1,200 years. People study Caesar. People study Plato. People study Homer. People claim to know the things that happened during Caesar's time, during Plato's time. And the earliest document that we have that tells their story is at least 1,000 years away from the first one that was written. People trust those books. The New Testament. The earliest copy we have of the New Testament is at the very most 50 years, 50 years away from the original. And people want to say it has been corrupted. Is that not madness? In a world where you think you know something about Caesar, from the book that was written, which the earliest copy you have is 1,000 years away from the original one. If you can trust such a book, how can you not trust a book that the earliest copy we have is 50 years? 50! Oh, and that's not all. Do you know how many manuscripts of the New Testament we have? We have over 24,000 and counting. Because archaeology is still discovering more. I mean, do you know the closest to this is Homer, 643, not up to 1,000 copies. Not up to 1,000, you know, parchments, different manuscripts. But for the gospel, for the New Testament, we are not talking about 1,000. We have over 24,000 different fragments and pieces of the New Testament from different sources. And when you gather all that together, we still find that there is agreement between them. Nothing, nothing, no doctrinal matter, nothing has been changed in any of the manuscripts of the New Testament that we have. The Dead Sea Scrolls, people talk about Dead Sea Scrolls a lot. And it's very important because the Dead Sea Scrolls um, that were found... In the 40s, around uh, 1947, thereabout. Now, those Dead Sea Scrolls were placed in a, in, a, in a cave in about AD 67. AD 67. AD 67 is about 30-something years after Jesus went to heaven. And it had been preserved there, therefore, for about 1,900 years. So when those scrolls were found... They were found to contain both scriptural and non-scriptural manuscripts because they were in jars, like clay pots. Huge discovery. And then we see that between this text and the earliest uh, Masoretic text, which was dated to about 916, which is about 1,000 years difference, the text has 95% word-to-word accuracy. The remaining 5% are minor variations such as spelling differences. Huh? And the use of conjunction, like comma, or spelling differences. Even in our world today, the way that Britons, the, the British spell color is different from how uh, our American people spell color. So, so sometimes there are omissions or in spelling differences. So we are looking at a gap of about 1,000 years. So we have these manuscripts and we have another one and the distance between them is about 1,000 years. Yet, such striking similarity and agreement. That's the kind of document that your Bible is. Are you there? Oh, let me, let, me, let me just run up to something that I think you will find interesting. There's so much um, here. Um, so, let's run a quick thought experiment. If you are a Christian, 
For instance, if you come from maybe a Christian majority place or wherever it is that you come from, do you know how difficult it is to know the names, the common names in your place where you come from now, the common names in your place uh, even 70 years ago? You know that names are kind of generational. They are names that are common in every generation. And across time, it changes. Number two, apart from those changes in the same place, there are differences from place to place. Okay? Ghanaian names are generally different from Nigerian names. Do you get what I'm talking about? And then Nigerian names, for instance, they also change across the years. The names that were predominant where you come from, 100 years ago, are not the names that are predominant in that same place today. The implication of that is this. If the New Testament was a forgery, if the New Testament was written after the fact, if it was written many years later, like some of the scholars will tell us, the New Testament writers will not be able to get the names right. How do we know that they got the names right? We know they got the names right because we have other literature that come from the same generation about which they wrote. So it's like saying, if you're writing a story of something that happened between 19... 1990 and 1995, you wrote a book, a historical account of, let's say, the biography of somebody. It happened between 1990 and 1995. Then, 100 years later, people now decided to say, this book is not accurate. This book was actually written just 50 years ago. Not 100 years ago. 50 years ago. Not 100 years ago. So, the idea is this. When archaeologists... The scholars that do these critical things and his historians, when they are able to find other literature that were written between the same period that they are claiming this one was written, books that were written around 1990 to 1995, newspaper articles, those other biographies, they, then they now start to see the names of people. All right? They now start to see the names of people that lived in Lagos. Between 1990 and 1995, from newspaper articles and the other biographies that they have seen, then what scholars have done is to draw up a map to say what, what were the popular names in the first century ancient Near East where the story of Jesus happened. So let me run through this before I take my seat this evening. Now, the most popular name in the time where Jesus lived, when Jesus lived, according to history, historians, that is outside of the Bible, the most popular name, do you know what it is? Simon. The second most popular name, Joseph. The third popular name, Lazarus. Followed by Judas. Followed by John. Followed by Jesus or Joshua followed by Ananias, followed by Jonathan. Now, what you notice is this. So let me give you this. Occurrence in Josephus, it's 29. Now, the name Simon occurs in the Bible. It occurs in Josephus. It occurs in the Dead Sea Scroll. And in all of them, it is the most popular name in all those books. The other contrast is Jews that did not live Jews in the diaspora. As at the time of the New Testament event, they had a different set of names that the Jews in the diaspora bore. The third thing is that most of the, in fact, now almost the consensus is that as at the time that the New Testament was written, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, who wrote individually, independently, somehow they happened to not be in Jerusalem, in Israel, when they wrote. Do you understand? Even though they were Jews, they were not writing as at the time where they were geographically present in the land. But when we look at secular books that come from the same period, we find that the occurrence of these names in the scripture, they are the same as we find them 
in other secular materials. So that we now know that um, the top two names that men bear, Simon and Joseph, okay, it occurs 15.6%. That is 15.6% in other books that were written in that first century. And in scripture, it is 18.2%. The top nine names that are born by men is 41% of literature that comes from outside of the Bible in that era. And it is 40.3% of the Bible literature. Are you understanding what I'm saying? It means that with regards to the things that we can verify, with regards to the things that can be historically verified, every single time the Bible comes out on top. The Bible comes out accurate. So that in the things that can be checked, when you check it with secular books, secular historians, they say exactly the same thing that we find in scripture. In fact, there is a man, okay, my time is up. So let me tell you this before I said there is a man, a historian, that has said concerning Luke, the writer of the gospel, okay? Now, the Bible says that, uh, not the Bible, so let me, Luke, one of the writers of the gospel, and the writer of the book of Acts, is among the historians of the first rank, according to William Ramsey. He is a famous uh, historian. Now, this other person says that Luke names, this was what I was looking for, he names 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine islands without error. Let me read that again. This is coming from a secular historian. This man does not believe in Jesus. He's just a historian. He, they use the Bible. They, you can actually use Acts of the Apostles as a map for understanding the ancient Near East, where the stories that are in Acts of the Apostles come from. And Acts of the Apostles has been a helpful map for historians to reconstruct what the civilization of that time was like. So this historian tells us that Luke, I'm quoting him now, Luke names 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine islands without error. So again, I'm saying to you that the things that can be verified when we run a check, we see that the scriptures are accurate. Therefore, we can trust what the Bible says to us. Thank you very much. I'll see you tomorrow. Hallelujah. Clap your hands, get excited. Wow. Please rise to your feet. Hold your Bible in your hand. Lift up your Bible. Raise your voices and thank God. It's dependable, it's reliable, it's trustworthy. You can stand on it. Lift up your voices. Give Him thanks. You can stake your life on it. Yes, you can. If God says it, it's the truth, and they will confirm it. Wow. In the name of Jesus. What a great job. Let's appreciate our first to Thank you, thank you so much.